Hey everyone, welcome back to CSC348. So in this video, we're talking about the composition of two functions. So what we're going to do is we're going to define g as being a function from non-empty sets a to b, and f as a, not, as a function from non-empty sets b to c. Notice that g's codomain is the same thing as f's domain. That's going to be pretty important here. So the composition of f and g is the function f composed with g that takes elements from a and maps them to elements from c or in c so the domain here is a and the codomain is c and f composed with g is defined by if we apply f composed with g to x then it's exactly the same thing as taking f applied to g of x so i really want to stress right here is that when we say f composed with g of x, we're not saying apply g to x and then apply f. What we're saying is we're making a new function that does the same thing as if we applied f to g of x. So to really make this clear, let's say that we have our sets a, b, and c like this. Let's say this is our element x and we have g going between a and b and f going from b to c so if g maps x to some point here and then f maps that point to some point in c like this then the function f composed with g is a completely different function it, it has nothing to do with g and f except for the fact that it does similar things to them f composed with g is a separate function that takes this point and maps it directly to this point in c so i really i really can't express enough that f composed with g by itself isn't connected to g and f it's a separate function from the function g and the function f the only reason why they're similar is because f composed with g of x it happens to make the same transformation as if we applied g to x and then applied f to g of x. So that's really uh, something that I want to make because keeping this in mind as we go through the rest of this lecture is going to be super helpful. Just knowing that f composed with g is by itself a different function than f and g are. So as an example, we're going to let f and g be functions from the real numbers to the real numbers defined by f of x equals 2x minus 4 and g of x being equal to x squared. So notice that because f and g are both functions from the real numbers to the real numbers, we're able to not only compose f and g, but we're also able to compose g and f because basically the, the b sorry the domain of g is the same as the codomain of f and the codomain of g is the same as the domain of f so if we're trying to do f composed with g if we're trying to figure out what f composed with g is we can take a look at what it does to some arbitrary x in our domain so then f composed with g of x is basically going to be doing the same thing as taking f of g of x which is then the same thing as saying f applied to x squared, which is then 2x squared minus 4. So we can say that f composed with g of x equals 2x squared minus 4. Similarly, we can have g composed with f of x, which does the same thing as taking g applied to f of x, which then says, okay, so this is going to be g of 2x minus 4, which is then 2x minus 4 squared, which is 4x squared minus 16x plus 16. So this is just a quick example of our um, of function composition. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to take a, a quick sidetrack into talking about uh, inverse functions. So if we let f from non-empty set A to non-empty set B be a bijection, then we say that the inverse function of f 
f inverse here from b to a is a function such that if f of x equals y, then f uh, inverse of y equals x. And I want to really make it clear that f has to be a bijection in order for it to have an inverse. And the reason why is that, well, f has to be on two and one to one if f is a bijection. So if f is not on two, then any possible inverse function we could try to make is would uh, not be a function because it wouldn't be defined for everything in B. Since because f, uh, if f isn't on two, then uh, it doesn't have an output for every value in B. So every any possible inverse that we try to make wouldn't be able to take in every value of B as an input. So that violates the definition of function. f has to be one to one because otherwise, if f is not one to one, then if we tried to make an inverse for it, well what would happen is we would end up with a, a uh, we would end up with a mapping that since f has multiple outputs, oh, sorry, has multiple inputs that map to the same output, then if we tried to apply some sort of inverse function to that output, we would get two values. And you can't have a function take in one input and give you two outputs. So that would also violate the definition of function. Uh, sorry, yeah, definition of function. So f has to be a bijection in order for it to have an inverse. So to show f has an inverse or to show that f is invertible, we have to we would say we have to show f is one to one and then show f is on two. And then we can say, okay, well now f has an inverse. But you might be wondering, you know, some functions, it's pretty obvious what the inverse is, right? So say, for example, f1 from the uh, real numbers to the real numbers defined by f1 of x equals x cubed, right? The inverse of this is clearly uh, minus 1 of y equals the cube root of y, right? And similarly, if you have f2 from the positive real numbers to the real numbers defined by f2 of x equals the natural log of x, then clearly the inverse of this uh, is e to the y, right? And there are ways of going about this, but we have to be careful. We have to know for sure that we're not going to mess up because let's say we tried to do that same thing with a uh, f3 from the real numbers to the positive real numbers where um, f3 of x equals x squared, right? Then if we try to do something like, okay, well, f3 inverse of uh, y is going to be what? Plus or minus the square root of y. And all of a sudden we have trouble because we have a function that outputs two, uh, that has two outputs for this one input right here. So this actually, I, I said it's a function that has that, that's an oxymoron, this actually isn't a function. So the inverse of f3 uh, inverse does not exist. So what we have to do is we have to verify that the function that we think is an inverse actually works. And what we can do is we can talk about, we can use our, uh, our new tool of function composition in order to say, okay, well, I'm going to propose a function that I think is the inverse, and I'm going to verify a couple of things. And once I verify these things, then I know for sure that, uh, that F has an inverse. And because of that, you'll know that F is a bijection. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make a few more definitions that you'll want to follow along with because those definitions, oh, sorry, one definition that you'll want to follow along with and a theorem regarding that definition that's really important. So let's take a look at it. The definition is we're going to let A be a non-empty set. We say that the identity map for A is the function I sub A 
uh, where the domain is A and the codomain is A, defined by I sub X equals X. So all it does is it takes the function, uh, sorry, it takes an element in A and just brings it to itself. So I sub the real numbers, for example, applied to X is just X. So Y equals X is the identity map for the real numbers and also the integers and also the natural numbers and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So that's all the identity map does is it takes in an element and outputs the same element. Now, right here, I have a, a theorem that uh, shows that I sub A is a bijection and it's pretty trivial. Uh, I sub A is one to one by definition, really because since I sub X equals X, the only way for two inputs to equal each other when, um, sorry, the only way for two outputs to equal each other is for the two inputs that produce those outputs to equal each other. So this part is really trivial. We also say that I sub A is on two because it's defined for all A by definition of function. And what that means is because I sub A can take in any value as an input from A, then that may, means it must be able to output that value into A as well. So I sub A is because of that, because it can take in any input, then it can output any output to A. So um, I sub A is also on two. Therefore, by definition, I sub A is a bijection. So with this definition and with this theorem, I'm going to show a theorem that will make showing that a function is bijection possibly a lot easier for a lot of you. So let's take a look at that. All right. So I have this theorem here. We're going to let f be a function from a to b and g be a function from b to a. We say that f is a bijection and g equals f inverse if and only if f composed with g equals the um, identity function on b or the identity map on b and g composed with f equals the identity map on a. So this is a lot. Let's try to break it down. What I'm saying is if you take two functions f and g and you think that g is the inverse for f, what you have to do is basically show, I'm going to put some notes in blue, so this isn't actually part of the theorem, but what you need to show in order to prove that g equals f inverse, all you need to do is say that g of f of x equals x and f of g of y equals y for any x and y in your um, domain and codomain respectively. So for example, if we have f1 equals x, uh, f1 of x equals x cubed, right? What I want you to do, if you think you can say uh, f inverse of y equals the cube root of y, what I would want you to do is first take a look at and um, rather than calling this f inverse, I'm going to call this g sub 1 first off. So what I want you to say is let's, well, first what you want to do is make sure g sub 1 is a uh, function. And you can talk about that pretty easily. Uh, you can say that g sub 1 is a function because, well, the cube root of y is valid for all real numbers. It exists for all real numbers. And because it only produces one output for all real numbers. So this this part is easy. You can tell you can pretty easily just gloss over g sub one is a function. So then what I want you to do in order to prove that f one is or sorry, g one equals f one inverse, is I want you to show two things. First, that g sub one applied to f sub one applied to x equals x. So we can test that really quickly. This is equal to g sub one of x cubed, which equals the cube root of x cubed, which equals x. So that works. And then I also want you to show that f sub 1 applied to g sub 1 of y equals y. So this would be f sub 1 applied to the cube root of y, which is then the cube root of y cubed, which is y. So that checks out as well. And thus, what I'm saying is we can use this theorem to say that now, well, since we figured that out, now we know that f is a bijection and g equals f inverse. 
So let's take another example of this uh, where I'm going to do F2. So I'm going to call this, rather than just going out uh, guns blazing, saying that this is F2 inverse, I'm going to say that this is G2. G2 of y equals e to the y. So in order to show that G2 is the inverse of F2, all we do is we say, OK, well, G2 applied to F2 applied to x equals g2 applied to the natural log of x, which equals e to the natural log of x, which equals x. So that part checks out. And then f2 applied to g2 applied to x, or sorry, to y, let's say, equals f2 applied to e to the x, which is the natural log of e to the x, I switched x to y. So this should be y, this should be y as well. Natural log of e to the y is just y. So that checks out as well. Now we can also use this to show why x squared can't have an inverse. So if we say that f, cubed, uh, f sub 3 of x equals x squared and g sub 3 of x equals the square root of x, right? Let's take a look at uh, G sub, a g sub 3 applied to f sub 3 applied to x is going to be g sub 3 applied to um, x squared, which is then the square root of x squared. Now, this seems fine at the moment, but what you have to notice is that when we take the square root of x squared, if we're saying that g sub 3 is a function, we can't say that this is plus or minus the square root of x squared because that's illegal. Uh, you can't have a function take in one input and give two outputs. That just follows from the definition of function. So then what we have to do is we have to pick one. We either have to pick the positive square root of x squared or the negative square root of x squared. So let's take the positive square root. So we're going to say that this is equal to the absolute value of x, so that this always gives us the positive. Now, what we can see is if we plug in a negative value, so let's say g sub 3, like, okay, so for this to, for basically, what we need to show is that this whole thing works for all x. So for all x, g sub 3 applied to f sub 3 applied to x should equal x. But when we take g sub 3 applied to f sub 3 applied to negative 1, that will be the square root of negative 1 squared, which is the square root of 1. And we're going to, we uh, arbitrarily chose the positive square root of 1 right here. So this gives us 1. And since 1 is not equal to negative 1, that's bad. Alternatively, what we could say is then, okay, well, let's take the negative square root. So we'll take the negative absolute value of x. So then what we can do there is say, okay, well, in this case, we have another counterexample of g sub 3 applied to f sub 3 applied to 1. It's going to be equal to the square root of 1 squared, which is the square root of 1. And since we're taking the negative square root, this gives us negative 1. And since negative 1 is not equal to 1, we have problems there again. So no matter what, we, no matter what choice we take, we always have some counterexample that we can do to show that uh, this whole thing is not universal for all x. So basically, that's the whole point of this proof, is that I want you to be able to say, okay, well, we have this f2 here. I want to I want to say, I'm, I'm pretty positive that this g2 is equal to f2 inverse. And what I want to do is I want you to be able to use this theorem to, with mathematical rigor, say for 100% certain, well, because these two properties are satisfied, then g equals f inverse. And then just uh, as an FYI, the reason why I say f is a bijection here and g equals f inverse is that we need f to be a bijection in order for it to even have an inverse. So we need to prove this on the way to showing that g equals f inverse. So hopefully that was enough explanation. With all of that, this is an if and only if proof. So let's start uh, proving one of the directions. Now, the four direction is going to be a lot easier. I mean, you can see how long that the, four, the f proof of the four direction is. It's very short. So let's take a look at that. 
g compose what we're going to do is we're assuming f is a bijection and that g equals f inverse if we take g composed with f basically this is going to be f inverse applied to f applied to some x for x in our domain and we can immediately apply the definition of inverse which is somewhere in my notes right here we can immediately apply the definition of inverse because the definition of inverse is defined as if f of x is y, then f of minus, uh, sorry, f inverse of y equals x. So that tells us that f inverse applied to f of x is equal to x. And then just substituting back in all of our terminology, it basically means that g composed with f is equal to the identity matrix on A because g composed with f equals of applied to some x in our domain will always equal x just from the definition of inverse and then to show the other one what i do is i let x be in a y be in b such that f of x equals y and then i just do this uh, equation right here f applied to f composed with g of y is equal to f applied to g applied to y and then just substitute in the fact that g equals f inverse from our assumption up here so f applied to f inverse of y is equal to f of x, which equals y. And then y equals the identity map over b of y, since this identity map just brings y to itself. So then we have here that f composed with g of y equals i sub b of y. So that's exactly what we're trying to prove. And that's the first part of this, question, uh, of this uh, theorem. This one is definitely the much easier one to prove. So... Uh, if you have any questions on this, definitely now is a great time to pause, ask any questions, try to get any uh, feedback before you move on. For the back half of this, uh, this is where things get a little more complicated. <laughs> We're assuming that F composed with G is equal to the identity matrix on B and that G composed with F is equal to the identity matrix on A. Or in other words, F applied to G basically brings any element from F's codomain back to itself and G uh, applied to F brings any element from F's domain back to itself. So what I have here is a claim, and if I'm not mistaken, I haven't used a claim before. Now you can think of a claim as basically being a lemma that you prove inside of your proof. So what I could have done is I could have written two, uh, as I could have written a lemma here that says, if F composed with G equals I sub B and G composed with F equals I sub A, then F, equal, uh, then F is one to one. I could have written that lemma ahead of time and proven that and then done it in here. What I've chosen to do instead is I've chosen to write it as a claim right here. The claim is that given all of the information that I have so far, I want to show that F is one to one. The reason why I have a claim is that I think it, I think that this being a claim in here puts it in context with the proof a lot easier because you can see immediately that the point of this whole proof is to show that f is a bijection. So uh, the claim that f is one to one is the first step in showing that f is a bijection. So I think it gives uh, this claim a lot more context to leave it as a claim rather than do it as a lemma. And also it sometimes using a claim instead of a lemma, it just helps your thoughts flow better if you're proving it in the middle of your proof. Really, it's up to personal preference. If you, if I wanted to do this as a lemma instead of as a claim, that's totally fine. I could have done this as a lemma. And you are welcome in your own proofs to either prove things as a lemma or prove things as a claim as I have right here. You just need to make sure that you format your claim statements, or your claim or lemma statements correctly. So whereas your lemma, you would have to explicitly include the things that you're assuming and then say those things imply the thing that you're trying to prove. In the claim, you already have the context of, well, we've already assumed all of this stuff and anything else that we've already shown between here and here. So all we need to do is just write down the claim, which is that, which is the conclusion that we're trying to make. And then we do the work to show that that conclusion is valid based on our, um, based on our assumptions. Now, the nice thing about separating this off in a claim is that I can do a proof by contradiction inside of the direct proof that we have going on here. So what I'm doing here to show that F is one to one, I'm supposing that F is not one to one seeking a contradiction. So we have 
that this is true and this is true and this is false. So that is our perfect proof by contradiction setup. So we're supposing that f is not one to one, which means that there is some x and y in our domain and z in our codomain such that f applied to x equals z, f applied to y equals z, and x is not equal to y. And that comes from the definition of one to one. If f is one to one, then if every then for every x and y such that f of x equals f of y, x must equal y. So if f is not one to one, we're saying that there must be some special x and y such that x is not equal to y, but f of x is equal to f of y. So then what I have here is I'm noting that g applied to f of x is equal to g of z. Now, since z equals f of x and z equals f of y, what I'm saying is that, uh, words, what am I saying here? Uh, Okay, so what I did was I made a quick modification to this because I noticed a small mistake. But so this con the uh, part explaining the contradiction here is going to be a little bit different. So we'll scratch this out for now. What we can say is that G composed with F of X is the same thing as taking G applied to F of X. Now we know that F of X is equal to Z, so this is equal to G of Z. And since G composed with F of X equals I equals the identity map on A of X, then we know that G composed with F of X equals X. So we have basically that G of X equals X. So I'll put that here. So G of, sorry, so that G of Z equals X. Furthermore, what we have is that G composed with F of Y is the same thing as saying G of Z since F of Y equals Z. And since G composed with F of Y equals I sub A of Y, which equals Y, then we have that G of Z equals Y. And here's the problem. The contradiction comes in the fact that G is a function and yet g of x equals, uh, sorry, g of z equals x and g of y, words, g of z equals y when x is not equal to y. So this completely contradicts the definition of g being a function. So our contradiction basically shows that we have g of z equals x and g of z equals y, but g is supposed to be a function. That's not good. So we have thus f must be one to one, since the assumption that we made in order to get to this contradiction is that f is not one to one. So that's a proof of this claim. Now what we have on the next part is another claim. We're going to do something similar. We're claiming now that f is on two. So our assumption is that is basically everything that we've shown so far, that G composed with F is the identity uh, map on A, F composed with G is the identity map on B, and we also know that F is one-to-one, -one, but this isn't going to be as important. So for a claim that F is on two, we're going to suppose otherwise for a contradiction. So we're supposing that F is not on two. Then we're saying that there is some Y in our codomain B such that for all for all little a and big a, f of a is not equal to y. This just is the definition of something not being on two, which is that, remember that if a function is on two, then there is always an input that gives us every output in our codomain. So what we're saying is that if a function is not on two, then there's some special value in the codomain such that no input equals y. And what I did, I put a star up here. And what that means is I'm actually going to draw a star later on. You can actually see the star right there that will basically call this fact back into question. So we'll say that since G is a function, G of Y must exist because G, G's domain is B. So since Y is in B, we must have a value for G of Y. So we're gonna say, let X be such that G of Y equals X. 
then what I did is I basically started with y, which is equal to the identity map over b on y, which isn't saying much because the identity map on b just takes it, will take in y and just give out y anyway. But the reason why I put this is so that I can I can apply our um, I can apply our assumption that f oh, that f composed with g equals the identity map over b. So using this assumption, we can go from this line to this line, saying that f composed with g equal uh, f composed with g of y equals y. Then this equals f of x. And because f is not on 2, and we said that y is the special value such that no f of a equals y, well, this includes x. f of x cannot equal y by this starred fact up here. So then what we end up having is that y is not equal to y, which is our contradiction. Thus, f is on 2. f is on 2 because if f is not on 2, we basically get to the point where we're saying that there's some value y such that y is not equal to itself, which is really weird and scary. We don't need to worry about that because that can't be possibly true. So this is a proof for that shows that f is on 2. So we've shown basically that f is 1 to 1 and f is on 2. So by definition of bijection, we know that f is a bijection. Since a bijection blah, definition, we know that f is a bijection because a bijection is a function that is one to one and on two. So we have that f is a bijection. This is the first part of the thing that we're trying to show in the theorem. Remember that our theorem is trying to prove that f is a bijection and g equals f inverse. And this is the thing we need to show first to show that f inverse even exists. Because if f inverse doesn't exist, then how can we have g equal f inverse, right? Anyway. So now we have that f is a bijection. And then since g composed with f is equal to the identity map of a, remember, we, we talked about this in the first part of the proof, but this just means that uh, g composed with f com uh, of x, or g applied to f of x is just equal to x, which this basically means, for since this is true for any x in our domain, this just implies that g equals f inverse. So that follows by definition of inverse function. So that is our theorem. And honestly, I really love this theorem a lot. Um, I'm Maybe I'm a little bit biased because I did the work to construct this proof by myself without uh, ever any sort of guidance. This was like my first big proof that I ever, that I ever created for um, any sort of lesson material. Uh, and the reason why I created this is because I think it's important for students to be able to, you know, talk about inverses in a way that's familiar to them back from when we were talking about inverses in classes like algebra and calculus and that kind of stuff. So this theorem is basically what lets you say, well, hey, I think this function is the inverse of this function. It gives you the outline to say, well, that's awesome. You can do that. Just show that these two facts are true, that f applied to g is of y is x, and f of, and g applied to f of x is x. And then you're and then you're golden. Okay, so based on the last couple days of lecture, the last couple of videos of lecture, if we want to show that f is invertible, or if we want to show that f is a bijection. We have two ways of doing this. The first is that we can show that f is 1 to 1 and on 2. This just follows from the definition of bijection. And then if we know that f is a bijection, then f is invertible, slash f has an inverse and all that kind of stuff. Or the second option we can do now is we can propose some g from f's codomain to f's domain and then show that f and g undo each other. And that is... Um, that's the other way. What we'll then show is that f is invertible, which means that f is a bijection. So if you see a question like, hey, here's this crazy function, show that this crazy function has an, it has an inverse or is a bijection or something like that, you can use either one of these to show that it is a bijection. And yeah, 
those uh, techniques, you know, you don't have to, I won't necessarily ask you, hey, use technique number one to show that f is one to one and onto, or use technique number two to show that f is one to one or onto, or to, to show that all this stuff is true. What I'll always do is I'll say, take this function, show that it's a bijection, and it is up to you to figure out how you want to do that. All right, so I have one corollary that I want to show, and this one is going to be very easy. It's a corollary, which means that it follows directly from the results of our last theorem, the theorem that lets us show that if two functions undo each other, then they are inverses of each other. So a corollary, if we let h be a function from some set a to some set b, then the inverse function of h inverse is equal to h. All we have to do to show this, let me pull up the uh, theorem definition again. All we would have to do to show this is take this theorem and for h inverse, uh, just put h inverse into f and h into g. And once we do that, basically h inverse and h undo each other. So we're totally good to go from there. So all we have to write for this, this is a super trivial proof. We can say that this can be seen. Let me actually write the proof symbol as well. This can be seen by applying the previous theorem. and using h inverse as f and h as g. And I'll let you all I'll let you all take the time to play with that yourself and see see if that makes sense. Basically what you want to do is show that h inverse and h undo each other which should be pretty trivial. So then that means that h is equal to h inverse is inverse. All right, well, that is all for this video. Actually, no, it is not all for this video, my bad. There's one more theorem I wanna show, which is if we have F from B to C, and right now we're not even worrying about the identity map anymore. This is something entirely different. If we take F as a function from B to C, and g as a function from a to b, if both of these are one to one, then f composed with g that goes, which goes from a to c is one to one. Here's how we can prove this. We're going to prove it by assuming that both f and g are one to one. We're gonna say, suppose just we're going to do a pretty standard proof of a function being one to one. So we'll start off with suppose x and y are elements in A such that f composed with g of x equals f composed with g of y. What we eventually want to do is then show that x equals y. And if we can show that x equals y, then we know that f composed with g of x Oh, sorry, f composed with g is a one-to-one -one function. So what we'll do is we'll note that if f composed with g of x equals f composed with g of y, by definition of function composition, that means f of g of x is equal to f of g of y. Now, what I'm going to say is we're going to let z be equal to g of x and w be equal to g of y. Basically, then I'll just do a substitution. So we'll say then that f of z equals f of w. Now, what we have here is that by our assumption, f is one to one. So we'll say since f is one to one. This means that z is equal to w. 
So that means g of x is equal to g of y, just by pure substitution of what z and w are equal to. Now we have that since g is 1 to 1, this basically gives us that x equals y. So we started off by assuming that f of g, f applied to sorry f composed with g of x equals f composed with g of y. We have shown that x equals y. So therefore, for f composed with g of x, or sorry, f composed with g is one to one. So I would take note of how this theorem works because there's another theorem. If f from b to c and g from a to b are both on two, then f composed with g from a to c is on two. You're going to prove this in your homework, and homework six is what it should be. So you should maybe keep in mind, the proof for this won't look exactly like this, but it will follow some similar patterns where you're starting with some assumptions regarding f composed with g, and then you use the information that f and g are on two in order to show that f composed with g is on two. So keep that in consideration. What this means is when you end up showing this, and since we have already showed this, the corollary of this is that if f from b to c and g from a to b are bijections, it means that f and g are one to one, so f composed with g is one to one by this theorem. It also means that f and g are on two, so f composed with g is on two by this theorem, which you will show. So that means that f composed with g is a bijection. That just follows directly from those two theorems and the definition of bijections. Then f composed with g from a to c is a bijection. All right, so that's a whole lot on function composition, and that will end up doing it for this lesson. So thank you all so much for watching, and I hope you have an excellent rest of your day.